Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, welcome to the Land Records Meetup. Uh, I'm Brent Jones. I'm the Land Records Industry Manager for Esri. Today, we're going to talk about preparing your data for the parcel fabric. For those of you that have attended these webinars in the past, you'll know these are informal. And please, uh, <clears throat> please feel free to type questions into the question bar, in the, into the question, and feel free to use the uh, the chat box as well. We have a bunch of meetups at Esri. Um, this is the land records meetup. Uh, we have one for assessors and GIS, which focuses on valuation analysis, insights, public public access to data, some of those apps. Then we have uh, one for local government, one for state government. Uh, we have a new one for health and human services. So if you have anybody in your org that's interested in uh, opioid solutions and other general health issues, that's a good meetup. And then we have a list of all our meetups. Uh, at topic slash Esri. The, uh, I know this is a repeat for many of you, but for those of you that are new, the assessment, property tax and land records solution for Esri consists of four major components, parcel management, value analysis, field operations, and open data. Parcel management is driven by um, the core technology of parcel fabric, the data model and methods, and along with the parcel editing capabilities, um, there's a parcel drafting tool, there's a data reviewer tool, um, there's uh, tools to create tax map books. For those of you that happen to be in one of the 30 PLSS states in the US, there's a PLSS editing tool. There's an aggregation tool, community parcels for aggregating parcel data from uh, from different areas, from different uh, different parcel editing organizations, and then then there's workflow manager for large organizations that want to integrate uh, different technologies into their parcel workflow. But today we're going to talk about how to prepare your data for the parcel fabric. Uh, we're pretty fortunate to be able to grab some of Dan Stone's time. I don't know if any of you guys know Dan, but he's probably the busiest guy here at the company, and uh, uh, actually. Even today, we were juggling schedules to, to squeeze this in. So happy to have you, Dan, and I'm going to pass it over to you. Yeah, appreciate it, Brent. Let me see if I can. Well, as <clears throat> Brent said, good good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're at. Um, today, we're going to talk about preparing your data for the parcel fabric migration. Um, so um, this topic is just going to cover, um, if you're thinking about going into the parcel fabric, uh, what is it that you need to do to get your data uh, in a state that will load into the parcel fabric? Um, it's really not difficult. It's just uh, there's a lot of little um, uh, potholes in the road that you need to, to steer around in order to get there. So with that, I'm going to kick this off. So our land record solution, uh, as Brent kind of briefly mentioned, is part of a uh, bigger offering that we have out there. So we do have dashboards for um, the executives in the office. We have mobile solutions for appraisers. Uh, we have um, map book publishing solutions if you're required to adhere to some state standard. Uh, and then we also have constituent engagement uh, with tax parcel viewers and uh, my text distribution. If you haven't seen that uh, app yet, uh, highly recommend you go out to our solution site and take a look at the my text distribution site. Um, today, what we're really going to be concentrating on is this area down here, the GIS professional. Um, and I, I consider the GIS professional uh, the team that's um, getting all the deeds, getting all the plats, uh, entering that information in, and creating that system of record that then feeds. Uh, all the other components of the assessor's office. So let's step back a second and talk about what is a parcel fabric. Um, so we're, we're going to migrate our data into this parcel fabric, and we need to understand what is it that we're migrating our, our information into. So with the parcel fabric, um, out of the box, you get this data model. Um, this data model takes your cadastral data or your parcel data and divides it into the different parcel types. So we have uh, a cadastral framework for those that are in the PLSS states. 
Um, for those that are in uh, the Northeast are here in Texas. Um, that's where we would put like the original Texas land surveys are up in the Northeast. Uh, you just may ignore um, these four different parcel types, um, especially if you're on a, a block lot uh, type uh, designation of your of your or your section block lot of your of your parcel data. Then we have our tax parcels. We have our simultaneous conveyance. We also have our conveyance divisions, and then we also have encumbrances, our our, our easement type data. Along with that data model, we also get provide a set of tools that interacts for editing and maintenance of those different parcel types. And then we also have a set of workflows out here um, that we found were common among all of the different clients that we have that maintain parcel data. So typical workflows would be merging two parcels together uh, or maybe more than two parcels or the parcel that crosses the road we can merge together. Um, a parcel split by meets and bound where we may have a large tract of land and uh, we're selling off uh, a few acres and it may be on the southwest corner and we provide the uh, boundary description to split that out. Uh, we may have a large tract of land or even a, a smaller deeded area that just says, um, I just want to take the west half of that particular parcel and that would be a parcel split by area description. Um, we may have a parcel that we are confident that the boundaries are correct. And so we just want to use those boundaries to subdivide a particular parcel or split. And that would be a parcel split by parent parcel. Then we have workflows for doing a completely new subdivision, which would include a um, entry of your subdivision boundary, your uh, interior lots, and then taking some of those lots and converting them into your tax parcels. And then we also have that same workflow if we're using CAD data that's coming in from an engineering firm or from uh, a developer. And then we have this other one down here called boundary line adjustment, uh, which I call split uh, slash combo. So this is typical where I see this being used is um, I'm buying 10 feet of my neighbor's yard because I want to expand my driveway. So I, I split his property and combine it with mine. So I call that a, a split combo. So the reason we want to go to the parcel fabric is that we do have efficient workflows. Uh, we have a standardized data model that allows us to start sharing information between um, my county and my neighboring counties and, and even uh, aggregating up to the state. If we all know what a tax parcel is, we can all take a look at each other's data sets and, and realize what we're looking at. So if we un Take a look underneath the covers of what we have here, and we really need to do this to understand what we're, what we're migrating into. So when I go and I create a parcel fabric, um, I get this structure. A at the top of the structure is a plans table, and we use this to store the information about that parcel itself. Why is this parcel even here? Well, I I took that parcel and I split it into two parcels. And I went down and I recorded that information. I, I hired a surveyor, he came out, he split my parcels in two. I took the document he created, my, my uh, platted survey, and I take it to the recorder's office and I get that recorded. So I wanna take that information, the survey date, the surveyor who, who actually did the surveying, um, the document number that I get back from the recorder's office. Um, the date that it was actually recorded. Um, I want to take all that information and make sure that it is part of my parcels. So every parcel in a fabric belongs to a plan. There is a default plan out there called map, but every parcel belongs to a plan in, in the fabric. My parcels are made up of one or more lines. And at the end of those lines are points. And some of those points I will associate to a control point. And then some of those points through editing um, will become line points. So we take a look at our little diagram here. You can see that um, I have uh, an area which represents my parcel. That parcel is made up of lines. At the end of that line is points. And then some of those points may be associated to a control. So what is this line point thing out there? Well. Let's see if I can draw a parcel that would come right here. And I would enter this in using meets and bounds. And I would say this corner belongs to that corner right there. 
and this corner belongs to that corner right here. But for this particular track of land, I have an observation or a, a legal description that goes from this corner to that corner without referencing any break or points in here. So I can actually join this new parcel to my existing parcels right here. And these two points will glue this line to these additional parcel boundaries through something called a line point. And so that's where the line point comes in. When I go to join this, these two parcels will get connected here at this corner. And these two, this line will get connected to those two corners without breaking this particular line, which I think is one of the big benefits of our parcel uh, model, being able to solve that back lot, um, that back lot situation that has always been a challenge uh, with our cadastral data. All right, if I look at this from our catalog, you'll notice I have a feature data set. Within that feature data set lives my parcel fabric. And then inside that parcel fabric, I have this exact structure. I have my plans table out there. My parcels belong to that plans table. My parcels are made up of lines. At the end of those lines are points. Some of these points will be associated to a control network. And then some of my points may become line points as I'm editing my data. So this is what it would actually look like um, from the physical standpoint within Catalog. So what is a parcel? So we need to understand this uh, parcel fabric from the structure, the data structure, but then we also need to understand it from the logical structure. Um, so within the parcel fabric, um, and when I enable specifically the local government information model, um, I get these 12 different parcel types. Now, these 12 different parcel types have a history and they actually go back. Some of you may actually have this book sitting on a shelf somewhere uh, in your office. I believe this goes back to around 2004 um, when this book actually came out. Uh, but this, especially if you read the first seven chapters of this book, it really does um, describe and lay out the foundation of these different parcel types. And these different parcel types were developed um, in cooperation with the Federal Geographic Data Committee, specifically a subcommittee on cadastral data, um, who developed the standard, the cadastral data content standard. And so what we did at Esri is we just took that information and incorporated it into our data model. So this is not an Esri data model that we came up with. We're trying to use, again, industry standards that are out there. So within our local government information model, there is a um, attribute um, on our parcel fabric called type. And when that type is calculated to say seven, then I know that I'm dealing with a tax parcel. If that uh, value is calculated to uh, type five, then I know I'm talking about my simultaneous conveyance or my subdivision boundaries or my condominium boundaries. Um, if I have my parcels typed as type six, then I'm looking at lots and units and public right of ways and common elements and uh, parks. Uh, so those all become part of our conveyance division. And then some of those conveyance division, the lots will become tax parcels. I may also have my um, encumbrances or easements out there. Um, I may also have air rights or mineral rights that I can model. And then um, there's, you know, the all encompassing other and then our PLSS up at the top, the one through four. If you live in a state that is not a PLSS state, um, you just ignore um, these first four types and you work with the other parcel types that you're you're mapping. But if you have that book, I highly encourage you to hold on to it. So, so just to recap this, this parcel fabric and, and why we would want to move to it, um, it is off the shelf software. So if I have a standard or advanced license of uh, ArcMap, um, I get to use um, this parcel fabric technology without any additional costs. Um, it is based on a data model that's based on industry standards, right? So um, that's a benefit there. So now as I start aggregating data or working with my neighbors, we all know what we're uh, mapping and what we're talking about. Uh, type seven is a tax parcel. Uh, we have these improved workflows 
based on the daily operations that people perform. Um, part of the parcel fabric includes the job tracking. So we know who, what, when, and where particular edits were made. Over time, we can improve the accuracy of your data by saying that I have a more accurate survey that I want to enter into my parcel fabric, and I want to make the surrounding parcels meet the more accurate survey um, and when, when we do the join. Or I have a less accurate survey, and I want to make it more accurate by surrounding it to my parcels that are already in my fabric. Um, again, a different different joining method. And then the date, data integrity is built into the fabric. So the topology is, is built in. And then we keep track of history, both the system date, the date that it was actually entered into the, the parcel fabric, or the date that it was actually recorded and became a legal um, parcel. So we keep track of both those dates, which allow us to create different views of our data um, if we need to, that show, you know, what, what did my parcel fabric actually look like from a legal standpoint on January 1st of 2015? So we could, we could use the legal start dates and end dates to actually take a look at that and, and create a view of our data to, to see that. So that's the benefits, and this is why we would want to go into the parcel fabric. So how do we get there? So the migration workflow is pretty common. Um, and uh, I've done this workflow many times, um, and it seems to be uh, a consistent workflow, and it seems to be one that, that works well, regardless of some of the data um, that we start out with. And we start out with different types of quality of data. Uh, some data may be coming in from CAD, um, some may be coming in from shapefiles, uh, some may be coming in um, from legacy data, such as coverages, uh, some may be coming in as regular feature classes within a topology. Uh, the first thing we want to do is we want to identify uh, our source data, and we want to figure out where does that go within the local government information model of our parcel fabric. So that's an effort that um, uh, usually when I help a client, uh, we spend at least a day, maybe a day and a half, depending on how complex um, their land records are. Um, on this particular area. It, it's a lot easier to make a change in a spreadsheet as far as attribute goes um, here than it is once we have a physical database set up and need to make a change to a field. So we wanna, make a, we wanna start here and identify our source to, to target mapping. Once we do that, we'll create a working geodatabase and we'll import some of our source data. Um, chances are you're not gonna be able to do this um, you know, stop all editing on your data and say, we're going to, you know, migrate over the next couple months into the parcel fabric. So uh, we need to come up with a methodology of doing portions of your area at a time. So um, we want to take an area and bring it into a working geodatabase um, to actually process the geometry and the attributes and everything, which is really our next step. We want to prepare our geometry and any attributes that um, are gonna be required for the migration into the fabric. There is a staging geodatabase um, that you can get as part of the tax parcel editing solution template. Um, there is a directory in there, and I'll speak about this a little bit further uh, in my presentation, where you can get the geodatabase as a staging um, and uh, load your data into that. Let's validate the topology and I'll explain the topology rules that we need to get into the fabric. And then we load our data into the parcel fabric. So these four, or I should say five steps right here are really the crucial steps. And again, um, we always wanna do this in a pilot data at some point so that we can develop the algorithm and then build upon that uh, into more of a production mode. And as you keep migrating sections of your data, it should become easier and smoother and faster as you go. So if we look at our first step, the source to target feature class mapping. Um, you wanna go through and you wanna take an inventory of your data. Uh, so um, a lot of times I come across clients and they provide me data and I say, start looking through some of their feature data sets. Um, you'll, you'll see different things out there like, you know, Tom's parcels, uh, Sam's parcels, 
and you start asking about these things um, and, you know, what are these? And they said, oh, that was a special project that we did. Uh, we don't really need those. So this is really a good time to, to start taking an inventory of your data and uh, maybe doing some house cleaning. Um, if it was something that was done as a special project, maybe you just archive that, um, get it out of your database, um, keep things, you know, nice, neat and clean, uh, maybe Im improve on the metadata of those features so that everybody knows what that data is. But um, I usually start off with a table that has a list of all the source feature classes that they are, um, the types of feature classes that they are, and then where are they going to go in my target feature class or my, my parcel fabric. So if I'm dealing with my tax parcels and I have and I know that they're polygons, then I know I'm going to locate those as a type seven tax parcel in my parcel fabric. If I only have lot lines out here and the only type is line and I've looked at these and these are just when two parcels were combined, um, the middle boundary between those two parcels was just copied into a lot line layer that I display as dashed lines. Um, and I really can't build polygons out of this data. Then I just leave them as lines and I'm not gonna load them into the parcel fabric. Um, that doesn't mean that I can't display them and still use them for my map production. I definitely can do that. Um, they just would not be part of the fabric itself. If I can create polygons out of them, uh, then they could be a candidate and I would put those in as uh, type six conveyance division. Um, I have polygons out there for my subdivision boundaries and there's a spot in my local government information model for those. Those would be type five simultaneous conveyance. Um, and some comments might be some misalignments between the tax parcels and the subdivision boundaries. So um, in theory, if the subdivision boundary is going along the back of a um, the, the parcels, um, they should be coincident within their boundary types. Uh, so we'd, we'd wanna either make sure that they're coincident um, or, or verify uh, before we load those in. But you know we wanna make some comments that, hey, this is something that we need to take a look at. Um, we have easements, those are polygons out there. I'm gonna load those in as type nine um, encumbrances. And some comments are, I have multiple easements stacked on top of each other. So just something that we're gonna to need to be aware of as we're migrating our data in, you know, not only do we have these polygons, but in certain areas, they're stacked on top of each other. And then I also have some parcel dimensions out there that have been handled as annotation. Um, they're non-feature linked. You know, what are we gonna do with those? Are we gonna put those into the parcel dims um, or are we just gonna reconfigure our feature linked annotation to look at that feature class? They won't be feature linked at the beginning, but as I do my edits moving forward, um, they will become parcel linked. So there is a handy tool out there called X-Ray for uh, Catalog. And if you go search um, uh, the internet for this, uh, you should be able to uh, get this add-in that you can use for our catalog. And one of the nice things this add-in does is it will uh, read in a database and create an XML that you can then open up into an Excel spreadsheet. And you can really use that to get an inventory of the feature classes that you have out there. Once we have these feature classes, the next thing we need to do is take a look at the attributes. So again, I revert back to a spreadsheet that says, okay, on my parcel fabric schema, I have all these fields that are part of the parcel fabric out of the box. And then I have additional fields that get appended on when I enable the local government information model. So I wanna start looking at, say for example, my tax parcels and say, okay, my tax parcels, when I look at the attributes, I have a field out there called pin and it's a text 12. So where does that get mapped to in my parcel fabric? Well, that's gonna go to name. Name is defined as text 50. So I got plenty of space to actually bring my pin across. Um, and then I'm saying over here in a comment, I'm gonna map pin to name and, and some other comments that I usually add in here and alias it to pin. I think by default it gets uh, aliased as parcel identification number. So in the fabric, 
since we're dealing with a single polygon feature class, um, everything that I use as an identifier, my subdivision name, um, the tax parcel um, ID, the uh, lot number, um, all are going to get mapped out to my name, and then we alias them to the particular types of parcels in the ArcMap document itself. Um, here I have a legal area that I want to bring across. I know this is what was on the record, so I would I want to make sure that I don't lose that. This was on the legal document, so I want to bring that information over, and I'm saying that's going to be mapped out to an attribute called stated area. Um, stated area is kind of a special field in the parcel fabric. If it is populated, um, we will not touch the value of that uh, attribute. Uh, if it's blank, um, we will calculate uh, the area, but it's going to be based upon the meets and bounds on the lines, um, not on the actual geometry. So there might be a little bit difference in the geometry shape area versus the area defined by the meets and bounds. Um, so we'd want to bring, make sure that anything that I had recorded in the past from the system of record, we bring in. And then down here, I might have some additional information that we start mapping out, such as uh, block number. All right, so block number is a text field as well. Um, it's four characters, and I'm mapping that over to our block designator uh, field as 10. So we want to get both the feature classes that were going to migrate into the fabric, and we want to look at the attributes and decide where they're going to go. Um, this is a process that, like I said, usually takes me the first day, day and a half, um, when we're doing a migration workshop, and it helps to have a lot of coffee on hand because it does get tedious and it's not, not really exciting. So things to consider as we start looking at your data, um, questions that you need to start asking yourself. Um, you know, as far as creating the working geo database and importing our source, um, we want to start thinking about how we're going to migrate our data into the fabric. Um, if we're going to divide it into manageable data sets, how are we going to do that? Um, are we going to use, if I'm in a PLSS state, can we use sections and quarter sections and clip all the parcels out from there, um, process it? and load it into the fabric a quarter section or section at a time, or maybe even a township at a time. Um, or I'm not in a PLSS state. Maybe I just want to grab um, a couple subdivisions and all the parcels that fall within those for the migration piece. Or um, I'm in a small community um, in New England, and I just want to grab um, certain villages and bring in you know, the uh, 500 or 1,000 uh, parcels within that village and migrate them at, at the same time. Um, like I said earlier, you probably won't have the, the capability of doing the entire data set, especially if we're talking about, you know, um, somewhere between 50,000 on up parcels. You're, you're going to want to be breaking those up into to smaller work units um, so that you can process the data and uh, continue maintaining uh, the land work flows, the land record workflows that are continuing to come in. So we're going to extract that data, put it into a working geo database, and then we're going to start asking ourselves some additional data, uh, or I'm sorry, additional questions. Um, do we have overlaps and gaps between our parcels? Um, do we have street right-of-ways as polygons, or, or do we have just blank areas within our, our right-of-ways? Um, do we have line data, and do we have line data that has COGO values on it? Um, do we have multi-segmented arcs? And what does that mean? I'm going to cover that here in just a little bit. Um, do we have multi-part polygons? And multi-part being um, the parcel that crosses the street um, or the parcel that um, has uh, somewhat been uh, separated from its other pieces. And so we can combine them together and handle it as one single feature. Um, and are all my other layers coincident with each other? So do my lot boundaries match my tax parcel boundaries and do they match my subdivision boundaries and do they all align with my right-of-way boundary um, so these are all questions that you start asking yourself and start investigating um, as you are um, doing your your processing on what needs to be done to get the data in so 
let's take a look at some of these questions. So analyzing our geometry. Um, if, I, if I'm only dealing with, say, polygons, and I don't have lines out there, first thing I'm going to want to do is I am going to want to take a look and see if I have overlapping polygons. Why? Well, one, let's investigate. Are they, um, is it from a conflict of two surveys? Uh, that would be one reason they would overlap. Um, if not, is it just, you know, an error in editing? Um, the, you know, when we first started using um, ArcMap to do our parcel editing, we didn't have a topology. So we may have introduced some, some overlaps and gaps in there. So I want to take a look and find these. And the reason I want to do this is if I uh, am going to create lines from my polygons, I would rather have those two boundaries cleaned up first rather than um creating lines that i'm going to have to clean up the lines and also the polygon boundary so i i want to i want to definitely clean up my polygon boundaries first um multi-part polygons all right so if i have a multi-part polygon and i am going to create lines from them i am going to create polygons back from my lines and i want to be able to recreate my multi-part polygons if i don't explode multi-part polygons before I uh, create my centroids, I may have a piece of my multi-part that does not have a centroid in it. And it will show up blank or it may not be added in as, at, at all. So I wanna check for multi-part polygons. And, it, and a quick, easy way to do that is to add a text field to your polygon data. Um, I usually call it is multi-part. Um, and I, I will add it as a text three. And then I will calculate that field and I'll make sure that I'm using Python as my interpreter. And um, I use the shape field with a dot is multipart. And that's going to populate my is multipart text field with a one or a zero. One, it is a multipart. Zero, there is no multipart. So if I check my data and I see that I do have multipart, um, then I'm going to want to run the explode. Um, our single multi-part to single part GP tool before I actually uh, create the centroids of my polygons. Um, so in order to load the parcels into the parcel fabric, I need to have both parcel polygons and parcel lines, okay? So if I had only had polygons, I need to generate the lines from there. And the tool I use to do that is my polygon to line geoprocessing tool. Uh, do not use feature to line. Uh, the polygon to line uh, will make sure that where there are shared boundaries that I only get one uh, arc in between there or one line segment in between those two polygons. And you may wanna identify and store your neighboring polygons for information so that you can verify that that line belong to you know what its left polygon value was and what its right polygon value was. And um, if there's a, a left polygon ID of negative one, sometimes you can use that to signify that these are gonna be um, road right of ways or they're exposed to the um, universe polygon that's out there. So if I'm only maintaining polygons, um, I went through, checked to see if I had multi-parts. I exploded them if I did. Um, I cleaned up any overlaps and gaps, and then I created line work out of my, my polygon data. So we want to make sure that we have features that align to each other. So if I have right away polygons and parcel polygons, um, are there any overlaps and gaps between those? Um, again, when I create lines, or maybe this is a lot and um, tax parcel or subdivision boundary and tax parcel. I want to make sure that these align as much as possible um, and that um, it is reflecting the system of record and not just uh, an error from my uh, editing. So there are some tools out there um, on the advanced toolbar. Uh, one that I use quite frequently is align to shape. And what the align to shape tool allows me to do is it allows me to um, click on kind of a little buffer tool, drag along my two different data sets, choose what data sets I wanna make sure are aligned, my parcel boundaries and my, my tax parcels, and I can give it a tolerance. If it's um, you know half a foot, 
I want to make sure that these two boundaries are exactly aligned together. And then I hit the align button and that'll actually go out there and align those features together so that they're coincident. So as we continue to analyze our data, right, um, we're going to come up with a certain process. We're going to say, well, um, I, I created my lines. Uh, I noticed that um, uh, some of my lines uh, needed to be extended or trimmed to remove dangles. So I, I can use an extend and trim GP tool to do that. Um, some of my lines did not come across planarized. So I need to planarize my lines. Um, which means that they're split at an intersection. And I may actually start off with line work. Uh, that line work may be coming from some legacy data, such as a coverage data set. And that coverage data set may have been stored in a librarian format at one time, where the line was split by a artificial tile boundary. And on each side of that line may have an attribute that says it's 100 feet when each segment of that line is only 50 feet. So I may want to go out there and analyze that information and unsplit lines along those uh, common attributes were, were possible. So if you notice, I have on this GP tool here, um, step two, process lines. So as you're going through and migrating the data, if this is something you're going to do repeatedly, you could create a model that's going to do the first thing. We're going to provide it an input data set and an output data set. Um, we may have that model unsplit the lines based on, on attributes. Uh, I can provide and expose tolerances to extend the line and um, uh, trim the line based on uh, dangles. So I can expose that, and that's part of the model. Um, and then I can actually have the, the model actually planarize the line for me as well. So instead of having to walk through each one of these steps, I create a model, I run that model, and my, now I have a data set um, that has the line work uh, that's been processed to a point where I can go in and investigate topology on that lines uh, before creating my polygons. Um, one of the real benefits about doing it as a model in a, in a GP tool is that if I need to go back and redo um, the uh, that particular processing, it's very easy for me to go back to my source data. I have an outputted line data set, so I can blow it away if something got corrupted and recreate this very easily. Or maybe my tolerances weren't just right. I can rerun the tool again, uh, changing up my tolerances to, to make sure that I remove as many errors as possible. So one of the things I had said that you ask yourself is multi-segmented lines, right? So what are multi-segmented lines and why are they an issue? So um, as we are analyzing our data, um, we can do a couple things. Um, as you know, ArcGIS Pro is out there and ArcGIS Pro has some pretty cool functionality. So without having to do anything, all right, I can go in and bring my line work in and I can go through and add additional symbology that says I want my green marker to be at the beginning of a line segment, my red line to be at the end. And then if you've ever worked with coverage data or shapefile data, you'll know that it had issues with curves. And so instead of actually creating a nice smooth curve, it actually put in a whole bunch of small vertices. And these are the things that we really want to try and eliminate uh, in our source data before loading it into the fabric. So using this symbology uh, with ArcGIS Pro, we're able to visualize this quickly and see where we need to clean this up. Um, there is a tool, and I'll discuss here in a second, called Simplify by Straight Lines and Circular Arcs. That's part of Pro that will assist with this data cleanup. Um, the other thing we want to take a look at is if I have line data and I do have COGO values existing on that line data, um, I want to check how accurate these line data are to my shape. So here I have a distance of 201.44. Here it's 201.21 not really much of a, a differential difference, but we want to make sure that um, the values that we have for our COGO values 
um, are within a tolerance of the actual length um, and also the direction is within a tolerance of the actual bearing of that arc. So there are some tools out there uh, that used to be out there. If anybody needs them, I can definitely um, uh, provide them through, say, a box account or something like that, um, that would go through and take a look at the direction and also take a look at the distance and compare them to the shape and also compare them to the angle and make sure that uh, we are bringing in uh, good data rather than bad data. Um, why does that make a difference? Well, I can show you a real example here of um, somebody that came to me with an issue that they had migrated some data in and when they began to work with this data, uh, they ran into issues. So here I have a um, uh, map or a couple tax parcels out here. Um, along this side, it's been subdivided. And the one I was interested in working on is this big track of land that was, was over here. So I clicked on it, I opened it up in the parcel fabric, and I noticed that I have uh, a lot of different errors uh, within my parcel details window. And so I start investigating, you know, why, why are, do I, am I showing errors here? And I noticed that over here, if I measure between this line or this corner point here and this corner point, um, it's really only 75 feet. But here, uh, according to the attributes, uh, it's 675 feet. So there's a 600 difference. Well, why this is important is as we start working with the fabric, I can click on what I call my parcel measurement tool, and I can say, show me what this parcel looks like based on how it is described by the meets and bounds. And so you notice if each one of these little segments that were here on this parcel were, were listed as 675, the way the parcel fabric is going to interpret that when I begin to edit this one parcel is it's going to see this left side as having 675 feet from this one corner all the way up to the other corner. So when you start editing, you're going to start noticing some weird behavior. So it's better to eliminate this before loading it into the parcel fabric. If, if we are not confident that these values are good, it's better to just gnaw those out and let the parcel fabric inverse that information on the way in. Um, another little tip you can do here is you can take these attribute values um, on your source data and on your parcel fabric and add additional attributes. So it may be something like label direction or label bearing uh, or label distance um, so that you can calculate that information before you load it up and, and maintain that information moving forward just in case you ever needed to reference it. You could always go back and compare it. Um, the tool set that I had talked about uh, is, is an older tool set. Uh, like I said, it, it, I can make this available through a box folder if need be. Um, I couldn't find it uh, when I searched on the internet, but there was a tool set out there. And one of the ones I used to like to use is fixed bad Kogo attribution. So the first one would allow you to uh, check the direction field and make sure that we didn't have any bad characters in there. The other tools in that tool set allowed me to check the distance on selected lines or the bearings on selected lines uh, to determine whether or not they were within a certain tolerance. Um, and the tolerance that I usually use, I go back and I look at the accuracy table of the parcel fabric, and you'll see that the tolerances that they use there, those are the tolerances that I specify when I run that particular tool. So I run these tools. Where it, is, where it finds bad source data, it's going to add a field called calculated, and it's going to place a one in that field. So now that I've identified that, I can do a couple things. I could run this last tool here, which goes out and makes every one of those uh, attributes null, the, the bearing and the distance and the arc length and, and so on of our Kogo fields. Or I could add, like I said, some label fields and copy those over so that I maintain them moving forward and then let the, the fabric go ahead and inverse those on the way in. Go ahead and run this tool and inverse them on the way in. So the multi-segmented lines and curves, like I said, from legacy data, um, this, in, this information is, is introduced. Um, if you take data that's 
been CAD data and actually has nice good curves on them um, and bring them into a feature class, those curves should be maintained and should, should stay. Um, the minute you take any data that has nice curves uh, to a shape file, you are most likely going to introduce these types of multi-segmented arcs. So uh, one recommendation I have is not to take your data to a shapefile. Uh, take them to a file geo database if you need to, or take them into a feature class, but, but try to avoid the shapefile um, uh, export. So there is an add-in uh, that you can download and install into ArcMap. And what it'll do is it'll, it'll allow you to find, uh, it'll actually select and detect multi-segmented arcs. And then you can split those arcs um, and you provide these tolerances. So you specify a lateral offset tolerance, which is really like a little buffer where it starts examining along the line boundaries to determine where there is a point of inflection. Where, where is it gonna change that I need to take this arc here and now I got a point that I'm gonna inflect and go in a different direction. So it, it, that, that lateral offset will help you determine where that split's gonna be. And then what is the smallest line I wanna create? Um, obviously we don't wanna create very tiny segments out there. Um, I know I have seen deeds um, one example that I saw the other day had a 3,000 foot radius with a 1.89 arc length. So we have very small um, arcs out there, but you know we want to keep this at a number where we're not generating very tiny lines all along here. And I can check this box on that say create circular curves, and it's actually going to create the circular curves that go along this uh, boundary here. The other thing I can do is jump over to Pro. And I can use that new tool that's out there called Simplify by Straight Lines and Circular Curves. The biggest difference between these two is that I can stick this into a model. So um, the model that I ran that did the extend and trim, I may also put this into the model. So now I can process the entire data set at once um, it, without having in, uh, to interact with my map display. So um, it, it is a little bit more efficient. However, I have found it does a really good job, but you may end up still with small areas that you would go back and use the curve and line just to, to clean up those particular uh, multi-segmented lines. But if you notice, um, these this heavy bolded black line was really a whole bunch of vertices all along here. And when I ran it through this tool, it actually gave me nice clean arcs out here that I could um, use. And this is what I'm actually looking for for my migrated data. Um, if you don't do this, this is what you'll actually end up in the fabric. Um, this area here is what we're looking for. Um, if you bring in multi-segmented arcs, this is what you'll find. Um, you can correct them once they are in the fabric. Um, it takes a little bit of work. Uh, usually my recommendation is to go look at the legal description of this. Um, go ahead and wipe out these particular um, references in my parcel details window and then redraw in that curve and you should be able to um, get back to this situation which is where we really want to be so at this point we've actually looked at our geometry we decided what we needed to do to our geometry uh, we either had line work that we uh, are going to use to create new polygons out of, or we started with polygons that we created lines from, we cleaned up the, the multi-segmented arcs, we cleaned up our overlaps and gaps, we have everything coincident. So I'm going to run a tool called Feature to Point to generate the centroids of my parcels, all right? So I take my source parcels, run this tool, I now have point data that has all the attributes for those particular parcels which is why I want to explode any multi-parts. I wanna make sure I get that point in each uh, part of those polygons. Um, after I create my polygons, I'll use a dissolve to recreate my multi-part polygons, okay? And the way I'm gonna create my polygons is I'm gonna give it my line data as my input. I'm gonna give it an output uh, feature class. I always call it clean parcels because I should be getting clean parcels at this point. Um, I can provide an XY, just know that if you do provide an XY, you're going to have to regenerate the line work from that because you're, you're telling it that it can move the, uh, the parcel boundaries or the line boundaries together uh, within a certain tolerance. 
And then I also provided my centroids, which will transfer the attributes from those points back onto my clean parcels. So sometimes I may come across a situation where I've already been modeling my condominiums um, as stacked parcels. So how do I get those across? They're not a multi-part, so a dissolve isn't gonna help me there. Um, the way you would actually do that is you can use a spatial join um, and use the spatial join with create, uh, keep all target features. And so what that'll do is if I have, um, you know, 10 to, you know, 100 uh, centroids stacked on top of each other, they will create a polygon for each one of those. And then just verify um, that the uh, pin number uh, has been transferred over for all 100. And um, you'll see uh, a join ID that gets created from this process that you can actually use to go back to the object ID and, and create those relates and, and bring any information across. So at this point in our migration workflow, um, we've done our identify map and source. We've created the working geo database. Uh, we've prepared our attributes. And now we're going to go create uh, a staging geo database. We'll validate the topology and then load. So creating the staging geo database um, comes with the tax parcel editing solution template. Um, within there is a layer package. Uh, you can unpack it, and it's going to give you a data set for each of the different parcel types that we can load up to our, our data into. So I'll load my tax parcels up into the type 7 tax parcels. Make sure you specify where you want to put this, and more importantly, make sure you specify your uh, projection information when you unpack the staging database. Uh, one other tip in there, you may have to actually rebuild some of the indexes, spatial indexes uh, within that data set. Uh, just something kind of strange happens to them from time to time. Uh, if you see features kind of disappear when you zoom in, uh, just go rebuild the spatial indexes and everything should be good. Uh, one of the benefits of using the staging geodatabase is that it has all the domains that the parcel fabric has. So it'll be real easy to start looking and making sure that we have all the attributes of our uh, data matching the attributes that the parcel fabric is expecting. And it also contains the required topology. So we'll load the data that we've processed into the staging, and we do that just by right-clicking and saying load and load data, which brings up the simple data loader. And then we can actually start using this to map field. So if I have a pin field, I could say, well, I want to map that to my name. I have my legal area. I want to map that to my stated area. So the load tool will actually allow me to do that. Um, and then I want to make sure I prepare my attributes. So I go back to my initial spreadsheet when I did my source to target mapping. And I say, <clears throat> OK, so on my polygons, I want to make sure I have name populated. I want to make sure my type is populated. And I want to make sure my plan name is populated. So plan name is a special attribute that if I have that on my source data and I populate that um, with, say, the subdivision name um, or the instrument number, it's going to create that record for me in the plan table and create that relationship between the parcels that I'm loading and the plan record. So as long as the parcels have that plan name on it, that's the record they'll be associated with within the plan table. And most importantly, all the data types and field names must match. So now that we've done that, we've attributed our, topo our attributes good. We want to validate our topology. We need six topology rules to get into the fabric. Um, must not self overlap, must not intersect, must be single part, must not intersect or touch interior, must be covered by boundary of, and the boundary must be covered by the boundary of the line. So parcels must be covered by lines and lines must be covered by the parcels. Um, if I validate my topology and I have zero errors and I have a type on my attributes and I have my um, plan name populated and my name field populated, um, this data should load. And I would use my load a topology tool. I would specify my parcel fabric, where that's actually going. I would specify the parcels that are the polygons of my topology. Um, input point features is optional. If you have point features and you want to bring some of the attributes in, you can you can do that. Uh, the minimum line string segment count, 
uh, I usually bump that up to avoid creating line strings. And line strings are uh, used mostly along natural features. Uh, what is the tolerance that I need to be within to match my control? Uh, do I want to import as unjoined? And this is helpful if I'm bringing in a subdivision that I want to precisely place. I'm confident that the geometry is good, but I want to place it precisely in a certain location. I can import them as unjoin and then use my join uh, tool to put them exactly where I want to. Um, how do I want to specify my direction units and my direction types? Uh, do I want to compute area for the new parcels? What units do I want to use? And more importantly, the accuracy that I'm going to use for these particular parcels. Um, so with that, I just want to talk about briefly some things that should be common sense, uh, but sometimes people don't always think of this. Uh, I kind of equate it to, do we really need a sign out there that says, you know, only cross when the cars have stopped? Um, uh, but I hear of deaths on freeways all the time, so obviously we might need some signs out there like that. So some common sense best practices are have an implementation plan. Um, Understand how many parcels you're migrating and how you're going to divide this up and how you're going to uh, segment and handle the maintenance of parcel work coming in. Um, I highly recommend having a dev environment and a test environment and a training environment, someplace a sandbox that your editors can start getting used to editing within the fabric. Um, understand <clears throat> the ArcGIS parcel editing solution. Um, go read the online help, especially if you look at our latest online help. Um, it's really improved and there's a lot of uh, accumulated knowledge that's occurred over the past years um, that's been incorporated into the help document. And then know the skills of your staff. Um, if they've never edited a topology before and you expect them to be cleaning up the data to have that topology ready, um, make sure that they're trained up on how to edit a topology and what's going to be required of that. And then more importantly, after it's been migrated, how they will work with that information in the fabric itself. Um, I have to give a shout out to uh, our uh, excellent instructor of the editing and maintaining parcels course that we have, uh, which I is one of the classes I would highly recommend getting your staff in once you guys have um, decided to migrate. Uh, he has a resource page out there, and you can find it on GeoNet. Um, it's community.esri.com, and it has just about every add-in and GP tool and link out there um, for uh, the parcel fabric. And one of the other tools that I didn't go into detail about, but you really need to have that foundation of everything I just discussed, um, is a tool that's part of the parcel fabric geoprocessing tools. And there is a data migration tool that will allow you to um, take your parcels, it'll generate the line of work for you, um, show you where you may need to clean up multi-segmented arcs, um, and then you will use your same polygons to pull them back out. So it's, it's really two tools. Um, and if you've uh, adhered to, you know, early on that GIS and land records data model, the ArcGIS uh, parcel data model that the book that I had showed earlier, it works really well. Um, and if you've worked with a topology, that tool works very well and may help streamline the process. Uh, so I notice I'm almost right on top of the hour. Um, I will open it up for any questions and answers. All right, Dan, we have a couple questions here. The um, one is, why are you creating centroids? This was about halfway into your presentation. Um, so if I am starting out with parcels and I only have parcels, um, I need to have both polygon parcels and lines to satisfy the topology that the parcel fabric is looking for. So if I've cleaned up my line work and I need to regenerate the polygons from that line work, I need to be able to transfer the attributes to my new polygons. And the centroid is what I use to actually transfer those attributes. Okay, great. Got another one. This is this is from the inside. This is from JD. Um, he asks if I have good attribution in my PLSS sections, do I need to load townships into the fabric when they rarely ever are edited, and can I easily dissolve them if I need to update? Absolutely. So no, you do not need to load your townships. Um, when I work with clients, one of the first things I do 
is I ask them if they have a township and range sections uh, feature class, I ask them, how do they use it for editing or is it just something that they use for map production? Uh, if it's map production, I typically tell them to leave it out. Um, if it's something that they do use for editing, um, we do investigate. Sections may be the best things to, to only load. Um, and that's just to satisfy you know, the uh, legal descriptions I say, starting at this section corner and proceeding to this direction and so on. Um, that you would have those sections in there. But yes, at any time they can be dissolved up uh, because part of the attributes on the sections themselves is the township and range numbers. Okay, great. I've, I've been pasting links to what you've been talking about throughout the presentation, but here's one. Um, I'd be interested in getting the COGO data validation tools. Okay. Is that easily accessed? accessed? I can put them out on Box, uh, Brent, and uh, okay. make them available through the meetup. Yep, and you put them up there, then I'll I'll get them out there. Okay, perfect. Okay, great. Okay, minimum line string. What is a good number to use with parcels that have shoreline on one side, but many small segments along a road or beside other parcels? For example, a subdivision that borders a shoreline. So the, the idea is uh, line strings are there to model natural features, exactly what was described, shorelines, rivers, those types of things. Um, when you're editing uh, in the fabric, if I try to join to a line string, I won't be able to do that. Uh, so I can explode the line string into multi-segment. So if I want to reduce the amount of line strings that are gonna be generated on the, on the import, I usually bump that number up to something like 256. And that's just because my computer science background, uh, it's a, uh, derivative of uh, the power of two um, and uh, but you could go 300 and it'll minimize those particular line strings and make them into arcs but that again is something to really investigate and the um, uh, processing tool that I showed uh, at the end there are, are there's a video out there that you can watch and it'll describe exactly how you can use shorelines and rivers to uh, identify those and make those into line strings if you want to all right, JD just typed in caps that he always uses 250. Ah, there you go. <laughs> okay, so here's a, uh, this is kind of a, this, this will be a little tricky. Okay, any news on X-Ray for ArcGIS Pro? Um, no, I do not have any um, news on that. Uh, X-Ray for uh, ArcMap or for Arc Catalog works very well, uh, but I do not know of any equivalent um, uh, coming in pro. Okay. Um, can you do the, I know the answer to this one. Can you do the entire migration in ArcGIS Pro? You could do and it definitely. You, okay. You, you could definitely do all the cleanup uh, using pro. Um, but I, you know, honestly have not checked if the loaded topology GP tool is in pro. Um, uh, I, I don't believe it is but uh, you would have to go back to ArcMap to create your parcel fabric and actually uh, load it. Can I edit the parcel fabric in ArcGIS Pro? Not yet. Uh, that is coming. Um, it's on the horizon, uh, but uh, it, not, not as of yet. Uh, you'll, you'll probably see something uh, probably more towards UC. Okay, and from JD, load topology GP tool is not supported in Pro. I didn't think it was. Um, it wouldn't make sense to have it in there, but I honestly never checked, never had that question before. All right, great. Well, calling once, calling twice. Any additional questions? Um, this will be recorded and posted. I think you did a great job, Dan. The uh, This is going to be a resource, uh, this recording, that's going to be quite durable for some time. So, if there's no more questions, I'd like to personally thank Dan, and I'd like to thank all of you for attending. And please send me your um, uh, your ideas and for uh, for for new uh, for new meetups and topics you'd like us to discuss, and places where you'd like us to you know open the hood and get into the mechanics a little bit more. Thanks again, and have a good morning, good evening, uh, or good afternoon wherever you are. Thanks, Brent. Thank you.